We build these tiny worlds, but often don't get to see them from the perspective of a tiny person actually inside the tiny world we've created. So in this video, I'm building a HO scale freight car specifically designed to mount a tiny camera. The camera I'm using is the tiny Insta360 GO 3, a very small camera with a unique ability to magnetically attach to pretty much any metallic object. My plan is to take advantage of its magnetism so that I can have an easy to use and very versatile camera setup for my model railroad. It all starts with Tinkercad, my favorite and super simple CAD program. I probably spent at least a day playing around with designs, starting with a large cumbersome design and eventually creating iterations over and over until eventually I landed on my final design. Comparing where I started to where I ended up, there are some major differences. It's always good to try building projects like this in 3D so you can visualize what does and doesn't work. So while I spent many hours building the model, it saved me lots of time compared to physically building each iteration of the model. All these files could be cut out using styrene or a hobby knife, but for accuracy I'm using a laser cutter and 3mm acrylic. When exporting SVG files from Tinkercad, you just need to make sure the object intersects the floor plane, like this. Now just click on the file you want, and then click export and it's ready for cutting. I'm using the BMO laser cutter for these parts. The files are loaded into the Beam Studio and positioned on the acrylic. Once the power is set, the files are cut. A thin foot plate is added to the base using a 0.5mm styrene. This stops the magnets from pulling through and also gives me a clean smooth base for the fabric which I'll be adding later. It doesn't have to be perfect as the edges will get trimmed. One of the problems when gluing acrylic is its smoothness. Glue doesn't typically stick to smooth surfaces. So to help with that, I sand each of the separate parts giving them a slightly rough surface. Or you could use something like Weld on 3 that melts the two halves creating a permanent bond. Before gluing, some cleaning is needed to remove the sanding dust. To attach all the parts I'm using epoxy. I could use super glue but I figure over time it gets brittle, which is fine for things that don't get handled, but for this it will be handled quite a bit. Once the 5 minute epoxy is mixed, you've got about 2 minutes to use it before it starts to set, so you need to be a little bit quick. The parts are designed to press fit, so once glue is applied the structure should hold itself together while the glue sets. The magnets are 8x3 neodymium magnets, very strong for their size and more than enough to hold the camera mount to the flatbed car. Again some epoxy is used to hold these in place. Once all the glue is cured I can trim away the excess styrene. Now it needs a metal plate for the camera to stick to. This is made with flat galvanized steel sheet that's 0.95mm thick. The template for this was printed using the SVG file from the backing plate as a guide. Once printed it is cut out and the template has some glue applied to the back using 3M Super 77. This glue works really well on paper. The template gets lined up into the corner and stuck down. To cut the metal I use a Dremel. It can be hard to get a good straight cut when doing it freehand, but if you go slow and take your time it can work. Also make sure to use reinforced cutting blades so that it doesn't shatter if it gets stuck and make sure to use safety glasses. And just remember that after cutting the metal, it will be quite hot so you'll probably want to pick it up with some pliers until it cools down. The edges will be rough so a quick filing will be necessary. I also recommend using a vacuum to clean the filings. These metal shards have a way of finding themselves into your hand when you least expect it. A test fit show that it fits just right. Just like the acrylic, the metal we need roughing up as well. A heavy grit sandpaper is used for these parts. The magnets in the camera are quite strong and I don't want it pulling the metal plate away from the acrylic mount. The other side of the metal plate will be cleaned and left smooth. Just like the rest, epoxy is used to attach the metal to the acrylic. With it on and centered a small weight is used to help press it down as the epoxy hardens.
And lastly, I'll add some fabric to the base. This will stop it from damaging the surface of the flatbed car I'll be building next. Any fabric will work. Here I'm using some leftover black fabric from the layout curtains I made previously. The base gets a coat of spray adhesive and then pressed onto the fabric. Pressing firmly so the glue gets a good hold of the fabric. Excess fabric is trimmed with a sharp hobby knife. And we have a mount for the camera that can slide and move freely. Now for the flatbed car, which is made using a combination of 3D printed, laser cut and purchase parts like the wheels and couplers. The model itself, just like the camera mount, was made using Tinkercad, trying out different designs until I found something that looked good. I could have just made a plain car simply for holding the camera, but I wanted something that would look good as well. The 3D printed parts are made on the Anycubic Photon Mono M5S. They're really easy to use printer with quite a large build plate. As for the resin, this is important because the parts not only need to be strong to hold the weight of the car, but also slightly flexible. My resin of choice for this is the Sunlu ABS-like resin. The perfect combination of strength and flexibility. After printing, the parts are cleaned and tidied up for assembly. The car alone will be very light. Some weight is added using liquid gravity. This will enable me to position the camera right on the edge of the car without having it tip over. The car underbody detail was designed specifically for this. Tapping on the bench will help the lead settle down into the compartments. If you overfill a compartment, a small magnetic screwdriver can help remove small amounts of lead. To hold it all in place, I drizzle some epoxy over the top. It will settle into the lead and create a lid so no lead particles will escape. I try not to put too much epoxy so that it doesn't extend over the top of the sections and edges. Once the epoxy starts to set, any excess, especially around the locating pins, is scraped away. Before attaching to the flatbed, I sand the acrylic again on both sides because the metal plate will be attached to the top and don't forget to clean it before gluing. This weighted piece is quite heavy so I make sure to put a liberal amount of epoxy so that it doesn't fall away later. Once down I use weights to hold and press it down so that it sits perfectly flush with the acrylic base. In the same way the metal plate was attached to the camera mount this metal plate is also attached to the flatbed base. I avoid putting too much epoxy because I want to avoid it oozing out from the sides as it's pressed down. Before committing to gluing the bogies in place, I dry fit them, insert the wheel sets and screw down the couplers. Now I can test the coupler height using a coupler height gauge tool from KD. If it needed adjusting, it could be done now, which would be easier than doing it later with all the parts glued in place. I also needed to file away the excess screw poking up through the metal plate that holds the coupler to the car. It was only a tiny amount, but it needed to go. Now all the tiny details can be attached. This is what turns the car from a functional camera car into a good looking freight car that could even be used just as a model to run around the layout. For the bogies, I make sure to avoid putting glue down into the locating hole. I only apply glue along the top surface. That way, if for whatever reason it needs to be removed, it will be much easier to break free and clean up for a replacement bogey. The other detailed parts are glued in as well, being careful not to damage them because even though they are made using ABS-like resin, they can still break. As the epoxy cures, I put inward pressure on the bogies. This is because the wheels will have a tendency to push outwards. This just gives them a bit of added force to hold themselves together as the car is rolling along the track. It's almost ready for painting, after washing and drying of course. The model is primed with red oxide. This is actually a great base colour for the model, as a lot of the cars from the location and era I'm modelling are painted in a red oxide colour. I like the Tamiya primers as they go on nice and thin with a good even coat. 
Using a hairdryer to speed up the drying is okay, but just make sure to use a very low heat. I'm basically using air only. This will prevent the paint from bubbling and also prevent the 3D printed parts from softening and warping. I'm no expert when it comes to painting. So I'll just give you a basic rundown of what I did. Firstly was some detail paint to help differentiate the underbody details. Like some blacks and metallic paints. I also use a bunch of rust colors to give the car a more weathered, chipped and used look. Nothing too dramatic because I want the car to look at least usable and it's not like it's completely falling apart. I also do some dry brushing with some white to help make the paint look faded. Once happy with the initial paint, I give it a spray with some Tamiya Flat Clear. This will give me a layer with some tooth for weathering powders. It doesn't need a thick coat, just a couple of passes which will be enough for the powders to stick to. A bunch of the Monroe models weathering powders are used to add highlights and shadings to the underbody of the car. Making sure to start lightly and work up, especially with the black. It's quite intense and easy to overdo. With the powders done, it gets a final flat clear spray. This will dull down some of the powders, so it might be necessary to repeat some of the weathering powder application until you get the look you desire. Also, don't forget to give the wheels a bit of paint as well. Then remove any excess from around the axle. Paint might also need removing from the bogies. This is done easily with something like the DCC Concepts axle bearing reamers. Now the wheels can be inserted for the final time, just being careful not to over flex the bogies so they don't break. For the bed of the car, I'm taking a bit of a shortcut and printing an image of some wood panels on paper. I use Photoshop to tile the image, and then some of the tools in Photoshop like the clone stamp tool to avoid any repeating patterns. After printing, I use some Tamiya Clear to seal the paper. This hopefully will give the paper some strength and make it last a bit longer considering the camera mount will be placed on top and slide around. Once cut out and test fitted, just to make sure it fits, I remove any of the white edges using some texture. Then a layer of Super 77 spray adhesive is applied to the back. I specifically use the 3M Super 77 because it's the only spray adhesive that I've found works well with paper. Once centered on the model, it's pressed down, pushing outwards towards the edge to help remove any bubbles. That completes the car. As a standalone car, I think it looks good. You probably wouldn't even know it's a specialty car specifically for holding the camera. The camera is simply placed on top, the magnets are strong enough to pick the car up as well, which I think is a good thing. You can slide the camera around as well without damaging the paper surface, thanks in part to the fabric of the camera mount. It's completely flexible as well, allowing you to get pretty much any camera angle you want. And because the car is really heavy with a low center of gravity, you can also have the camera hanging out over the side without it tipping the entire car over. You've just got to watch out that it doesn't crash into your scenery. It's perfect for using with the Insta360 GO 3. I also made four different angles. On a model railroad, you often don't want to look too high because it's often just the ceiling inside the room or the rooftop of your layout. After completing this car, I noticed the camera was sitting pretty high above the top of the train, which might be a problem for tunnels. So to make it more versatile, I created a second camera car with a depressed flatbed to get the height of the camera down lower. This worked perfectly and gives me even more flexibility for navigating around the layout and through tunnels and under bridges. There are two versions of the camera mount for the GO 3. The files for laser cutting will be available for free on my website. The files for the flatbed car will also be available to download through my website store for a very small price. However, if you're a $7 patron, you'll get free access to most of the items in my web store as part of the patron membership. Just remember these are the digital files and not the actual car itself. So you'll need to have either a 3D printer or a laser cutter to be able to build these models. 
You can also do some really cool shots by adding an image of a locomotive cab over the top of the footage. It adds another level of realism to the layout and makes driving around the layout using a camera so much fun. Overall, I'm really happy with how it's turned out. Once the scenery on my layout is done, I think this will provide some really cool perspectives of the layout and really highlight the model from the view of a person actually on the ground. Cheers and thanks for watching.